Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual event with Orbit Live and two great fantasy authors. Matthew Ward is the author of the debut novel, Legacy of Ash. Gareth Hanrahan is the author of The Gutter Prayer and the sequel, The Shadow Saint. All three books are out now from Orbit. You should see a green button on your screen in Crowdcast that says, buy Matthew and Gareth's books. Click there to open a new window with links to purchase all three books from retailers in the US and the UK. Before we get started, some quick logistics. Uh, this event is being recorded, and after it concludes, you'll be able to watch the replay and share it with your friends using the same Crowdcast link you used to enter. So if you have any uh, internet issues during the event, feel free to come back and watch later. We're also live streaming to the Orbit Twitter and Facebook accounts, and would love it if you boosted those videos to your own friends and followers on those sites, should you feel so inclined. Matthew and Gareth will be talking to each other about their books, but they'll also be answering your questions. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see an Ask a Question button. You can enter your questions there and also vote on your fellow attendees' questions so that the most popular questions are the first to get answered. You'll see there are already a few questions in there that you can start voting on. If you're watching on Twitter or Facebook, feel free to ask your questions within those platforms and we'll relay them to the authors. Last but not least, follow us on Crowdcast to be notified about future Orbit Live events. We have some exciting ones coming up, including one next week with science fiction authors Laura Lamb and Anne Leckie. And now, without further ado, I'm pleased to turn the event over to Matthew and Gareth. Take it away. You first. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, we got go there first. Hello, yeah. everyone. I'm Matthew Ward. I'm author of Legacy of Ash. Um, it's nice to be here. And over on the other side of the screen, or possibly that side of the screen, is Gareth. Say something about yourself, Gareth. Hi, I'm Gareth Hanrahan, or writer Hanrahan, depending on which fits on the cover. Um, yeah, I write books and games. The books specifically are The God of Prayer and The Shadow Saint, and the game is mostly role-playing games. And hello. All right, so we've got some questions, I think, already starting to come through in the chat at the bottom. If you've got any of your own that you don't see there, please do add them in and do vote if there's a question there you'd like us to answer. Um, I think the only request I have right at the start is to try and avoid having any spoilers in the questions because there'll be people here hopefully who haven't read either book and won't want those things uh, coming out blurted out by the author halfway through a live stream can't guarantee that we won't do that but let's try let's aim for it so uh yes with without further ado do you want to pick a question yes well we'll go for the top one here go there community vote uh, community both ways or whatever <clears throat> you both write the story <laughs> You both write stories that are very much character-driven, thank you very much, but also encompass vast world-building. When sitting down to start your dual series, which came first, the characters or the world? Which for you, characters or world first? Or are you going to avoid the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I should probably make an attempt at answering it, I guess. It's, um, it's a slightly weird one for me with Legacy of Ash because the world itself and some of the characters now go back 20 odd years so when i try to unpick the sequence of which they came in i actually don't know the answer um but actually as i started sitting down to write it how many years ago is this now it's a couple of years now when i actually started sitting down and writing it extra characters started forcing their way into the story um the world didn't necessarily change much after that point because they were then fitting into an established setting so both <laughs> it's an awful answer i do apologize for that but it, it, it's it's just it's one of those strange things i think as soon as you're in into it in any depth you find that actually the beginning and the end of the process start to get a little bit blurry i don't know if you find that gareth yeah i mean i i, I, I again it's, it's sort of neither i think technically the world would have come first in that I like you. Know, I had vague ideas that I wanted to use that were not characters for a long time. But it was like anything. It's like I didn't sort of sit down and like you know coherently build out the world. It was like you know I want to do stuff with alchemy and I have this like, vague idea for a Victorian city and that uh, and stuff. Um, and they all like received the book. Um, for the wicked characters, I mean. I said I spent many many years doing role playing games, so my sort of like writing muscles and so forth were all based around 
like interactive fiction and so forth, where you have a group of player characters or of players who are driving the story and you're just like they're set up the sort of supporting cast and react to them. So my first attempts at novels were fell very flat because my protagonist did nothing. Um, so it started with a character who basically would charge off at the drop of a hat and start stabbing things. And then so the other characters sort of built off her and sort of reacted to her and served as foils. Um, so I suppose technically I would say the world first, but that's like saying the pile of Lego bricks came before the minifigures. It's funny, isn't it, about protagonists? Because I, even all the way back, as far back as I can remember, I've always loved secondary characters way more than the person whose name is above the title. Um, and that's films, that's books, that's anything. And for years, it was something I absolutely struggled with when I was writing the stories because I, I want the little crazy guy off in the corner. I want Jack Sparrow. I'm not interested in uh, <laughs> the Turners or whatever the, the comparison is. Well, protagonists have, have all the, like, the job, like you know, moving the story along, going to all the board things and they have to be like you know, accessible and normal in most cases. It's, it's hard to write a really wacky protagonist that doesn't become irritating after 20 pages. Whereas a supporting character can sort of strut on, seat, on stage, have like wonderful dialogue for five pages and then like wander off or die or like, you know, go, I'm now going to be mysterious somewhere else. I have finished being the author entertaining themselves. I will now go somewhere else and someone else can have a go. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm sure, I suspect we're going to loop back to Tolkien over and over in this. But like, you know, Gandalf is like, you know, obviously the character that like, Tolkien's off on writing. And in both books, Gandalf, like, you know, nips off screen every five minutes. No, if Gandalf is here, the problem will be solved too quickly. What can we do to him this time? Ah, I know what, captured in a tower, killed by a Balrog. I must go off and fetch the necromancer. <laughs> Right. Um, does that answer that, or are we just? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can't hear anyone, so I think we're probably good. <laughs> so. Uh... Um. You want to ask the next question, or shall I? Oh, I'll let you. You've got a better accent for it. I really don't. Right. Um. <laughs> I suppose we just, we just answer this as well. What is the first fantasy book you remember reading? Do you think influenced you to <laughs> the author? Are we are we looping back around to Tolkien again already? Because certainly uh, <laughs> the Hob Hobbit, I didn't wasn't the first thing I read, but it was something that my mum read to me when I was about well I don't know about four or five or something like that, uh, and that's kind of where the slippery slope starts really. Um, what about yourself? Like pretty much exactly the same. Um, my mother, she didn't, she didn't read to but like you. Know, um, Lord of the Rings was like you know, a book that she like you know, got me into at a fairly early age because she'd read it like when it first came out. Apparently, my um, great spo spoilers here. Um, my uncle, when he was about like, eight or nine, read it and was like her weeping at the bottom of the stairs, going, "Is Gandalf really dead?" <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I read Lord of the Rings fairly early on, and that got me into fantasy. I, I don't think it was probably not the first fantasy book I, I read, but it's. Sorry, the earliest one I remember reading, and it's one that's like, you know, been a really huge influence on me. Because um, I got into like role playing games to begin my career through Tolkien as well. So, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's a strange thing because, of course, I, I had The Hobbit read to me, and then I read it myself a, a little bit later. And then on, on the shelf in one of the rooms in the house was my mom's copy of Lord of the Rings from, you know, she bought it at university. He said, no, no, you, you can't read that. You won't understand it, which is the last thing you should ever say to a child. Um, oh, and <laughs> it, it was that terrible thing. So I think by, by the time I, I was a, a seven, I think, when I finally got, no, I'm going to read it. So I sat, I sat and read it. From, how much I took in, I don't know. I do know that I remembered that there was there were two evil wizards whose name began with S. So that was actually doing better than I think that my mum did um, <laughs> at that point. She'll, she'll never see this it's fine um but the i got to the end of it and then was faced with the the sea of sort of um books for seven-year-olds in the school library that now i'm just going to read it again <laughs> that's when it started to go down really badly <laughs> did it inspire to the fantasy of author though or do you do you think that was an option or, wait, or wait, wait, when did you like you know, decide that you were going to try this whole writing thing I, I, it's one of these weird ones that I, I 
the more I unpick it, the more I find another thing that go, oh yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Because for years I thought that the first time I tried writing stories in a semi-serious way was sort of 20, nearly 25 years back now. I thought, no, I'm going to give this a go. I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure it's fine. Um, and all of that is now lost to posterity as far as I'm aware, which is a good thing. So hopefully no one will ever find it. Let's put it that way instead. Um, but actually, even at the time when I was about, about eight or nine, we used to have, uh, we had three English lessons a week and they were split into grammar, creative writing and spelling. Um, <laughs> And I would always get in trouble when the grammar one came back round because I wouldn't have finished writing the story that I'd been writing in the previous creative writing thing. And again, fortunately, all lost to the mists of time. That, that one I'm definitely certain about because I know I've destroyed all my old school books. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, but in terms of when I actually went, no, I think I can write a proper book start to finish. That's going back about Oh, the number keeps getting bigger. It's about eight years ago now, I think. Um, almost exactly, actually, because it was, I'm fairly sure it was May Day weekend or something similar to it. And I'd gone somewhere to see a performance of something and thought, no, actually, this is really good. I'm, I, I think I can do something like that now. And so I started writing it on the, on the bank holiday Monday, I think it would have been. So that's good timing, serendipity. serendipity. What about yourself? I like I always enjoyed writing, but I was horribly, horribly sensible. I thought, I know, I should get a job in computer science. I went to college and studied computer science, not like you know, literature or anything like you. Know, I get a serious, real job, and then write on the side. And then found it was a really, really boring, and b the company I was working for uh, downsized, like let everyone go after two years. And they're going right, screw this, I'll try freelance writing. And like yeah, it, it worked ever since. But um, again, again, that was all games. So the, the novels only started a few years ago, um, which is possibly why I had two, two protagonists who would just do stuff. Right. Um, both of you have found success with your debut books, and that doesn't happen off with debut authors. What is this that you believe made your books different from other debuts? I'm going to make you answer this one first. It's your turn. <laughs> um, I'm going to say a sheer unadulterated luck because I think a large chunk of it is catching the eye of the right person at the right time, the right acquisitions editor, or like the right blogger. Even you can you, you actually sort of like able to see like you. Know, when a particular person like reads your book and re reviews it, and like you know, goes out from there. Um, the other thing is like you know, it's while it's my first like you know big like you know big publisher fantasy book, I had been writing like full time for many many years, uh, doing games before that. So it wasn't like I sort of like you know, picked up a pen and like you know my first thing was perfect. Like I got my I think the million bad is, is it a million bad words you're supposed to write first or something. Yeah, that's the figure that gets banded around. It's all lies. It's way too low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I was being paid by the words, so I got like you know several million bad words having kind of, like, paid for them first. I mean, if you, if we're going for it, like my 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 technically my 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 debut book is the quintessential halfling, which did not do well, <laughs> but that was many many years ago and is now mercifully unavailable. Um. But yeah, I'm, I'm going for luck and having polished writing in another but another field which is very, very related because like, you know, there isn't a huge difference between one chunk of prose and the next in some ways. Yourself, what do you think? How, how, how do you achieve greatness? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't got there yet. Um, but I think, to be honest, my answer's shocking. This is going really dull for everyone watching because we both keep saying the same things just in a different order. Um, but I, th I think it's the same answer. I think look is a huge part of it. And of course, you've had all your uh, your background in the role play books. I spent 12 years writing army books and various bits and pieces for Games Workshop. And apart from anything else, what both of those things give you is the ability to actually work to deadlines and actually be a lot more self-critical perhaps than you would necessarily do if you come straight into writing novels off the bat because 
you do get to that point, you go, no, I'm going to have to change this or take this out because otherwise someone's going to tell me to do it. So I may as well do that now and we can all be a little bit happier uh, or a little bit less angry. It's kind of the same thing. Um, but I think it does help you get a better grasp on just... I was going to say the technique, the technique and technicalities of writing, but it's 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 the whole thing, really, isn't it? I mean, particularly for someone like myself who um, spent almost, in, in fact, all of my education being pushed towards science subjects, and so I said, "No, don't do the English thing. You'll never be any good at it. It's fine." Uh, <laughs> so there's a little bit of indication every day when I see a book on the shelf or whatever, but um, it's it's a really quite there's a lot it's not easy there's a lot of work involved but it's it's a very straightforward way of almost being able to learn in quite bite-sized chunks isn't it which is really really useful so that when you come down and go and now i need to write 100 200 250 000 words worth of continuous prose that people will like you've actually you've done it before you've just done it in lots of different places mm -hmm. uh, and it becomes much more easy much more easy that's good english it much easier as a task <laughs> i think because you know you've done this before so you can do it again yeah yeah you, you, you sort of like you, you've mastered like you know the 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 business of writing not the master but like you you, you know this basically sit, sit and chair make, make like you know type until words come <laughs> Yes, if you, it's it's the thing, isn't it? It's the uh, you can't fix something that hasn't been written yet, Indeed. and it's, it's pushing on through that. I'm still awful because I will sit down, I will write a sentence, and I will look at it and go, "That sentence is awful." And it's, uh, half an hour later, you think, "Still that first sentence. Where do I go from here?" <laughs> and on those rare occasions where I can go, "It's all right. It's horrible. I'll come back and fix it later." Then I'll write the rest of what I'm doing, and I'll come back and go, "Oh no, that's okay. It's fine." <laughs> Actually, do you do the thing where, like, you know, you like you do the whole sort of word vomit thing, like, you know, well, just get the first draft out, and I'll fix it later, or like, I because like because I suspect we, we we have similar backgrounds and similar beards and glasses anyway, which is just a whole mirror image thing. <laughs> but um, when I was doing freelance writing, there was there often wasn't time because deadlines to like do that much revision, so I got pretty good at, at like you know, turning out fairly polished first drafts that revised as it went along. Do the same thing or yeah a little bit um but for a slightly different reason because i've never had that much trouble with deadlines um my reason is i'm just really really lazy and the thought of going back and writing something <laughs> again more than about that 10 5 10 percent make it better uh oh, it drives me mad uh I think some of my most sort of stressful experiences were back when I would occasionally end up working for someone and say, can you go and do about five five different versions of this and I'll pick which one is the right one. And then no, no, tell me what you want and I'll go and write it because that's that's how I like to do things. Um, but I, I think it's the same principle. I, I, I can't conceive of the people who do that thing where they go, you know what, I've written 40,000 words of this book and it's all wrong, I'm going to start all over again. You know? Yeah, I, I, I see that. Uh, Often I just go, no, what are you doing? How do you do? That's weeks of work. But it works for some people. And I think that's one of the fan fascinating things, actually, is just how different everyone is, which, of course, is the last thing that a lot of people tell you when you start out working for a company writing or freelancing. You say, no, no, you'll do it this way. Regardless, this is how we do it here. No. <laughs> right. Um, is there an aspect of storytelling you find easiest? For example, a combat scene versus dialogue versus scene descriptions. What's easy? What's easy? Yeah. What's the fun well, part? Dialogue is easy if it's got secondary characters who have no burden of plot on them. <laughs> <laughs> I like doing those, which is why more and more of them show up the further you go through my books. Um, but I, I like oddball characters who have got a little bit of something, the ones that have a slightly different speech pattern or who are there because they're going to sit in the scene and they're going to tell a joke while everyone else is being po-faced and serious because the world's falling apart. I, I love those things. Um, I also love writing the last chapter, strangely, because by that point, it's really nice to be able to say goodbye to people, particularly if you're in a vaguely positive place, which so far, touch wood, uh, I've been able to do. Um, but battle scenes and 
very plot heavy dialogue can be very very slow and, and difficult for me partly because at this point i've written so many battle scenes in one way shape or form every time i write a sentence in my head and say no no you've done that already you can't do that in here and then i'll have to step back here but have i done it in this book no you've not done it for six years but you can still remember that it's there <laughs> I, I honestly don't know how some people uh, do it when they're writing much more battle intensive stuff and then exposition dialogue. I, I always have that first bit in my head. Is it, Does this read like exposition? No, no, the reader needs to know this. You have to put this in there. But but it will look like I'm just dumping information. It's all right, you are. People do expect it up to a point. <laughs> what about yourself? So I, what, 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 that's what's easiest. But what I, I keep finding myself doing is doing tour guides. Where like, you know, <laughs> I'm like you know, whole chapters of characters like you know, walk you around the place maybe told each other, maybe just like, you know, having this internal dialogue of themselves. And it's basically turned to like a city source book going like, you know, ah, here, 200 years ago, such and such happened. I, I, I do, like, my sort of instincts go to do sort of leap towards the whole world building and like, you know, info dumping. Um, there's a book which I always recommend, um, Jeff Vandermeer's uh, Wonder Book, which is basically a how-to guide on uh, writing Science fiction fantasy and like your fantastic, fantastic literature. And there's an essay in there by Kim Stanley Robinson, who did the Mars books, where he talks about like, you know, like, you know readers really like exposition. Like, you know, if, if you're in the, like, the science fiction fantasy genre, then your readers like, you know, are partly there for the world building and the background stuff, which is how he was justifying having like, you know, whole chapters on like, you know, the chemistry of the partial atmosphere, just like, you know, one character could. There's one bit in the Mars books where Captain literally gives a lecture on how we're going to engineer the Martian atmosphere to be more to be breathable. And I may have taken that on board slightly too much to go to fight against the urge, like, you know, right, 20,000 words in this book. What's happened? Nothing, but they've really admired the city they were in and talked a lot about its history. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I, I, I always remember when I, I read Le Miserable years ago, is that it's, it's really... It's a wonderfully written book, but occasionally, Victor Hugo will suddenly just stop and go, and now here's a chapter on something vaguely connected to the storyline. Here's a chapter on criminal language that they use in Paris at this time. But I didn't need to know any of that, but thank you. <laughs> that used to be much, much more acceptable. Like, you know, Moby Dick has, like, you know, and now we will stop the story and talk about whaling for a long time. Not these characters whaling, just the business of whaling. Also, here's a chapter on whiteness and its mystical nature. <laughs> now, again, it's it's one of the things Tolkien gets a lot of a lot of stick for. But I love those chapters when I was a kid, and I I sadly appreciate now that I probably can't get away with doing that. Is that here's the potted history of the world? We're going to call it Shadow of the Past, and it's going to look like a conversation between two characters in the book. But really, I'm just establishing this for you, dear reader. Um, but, but, I think. My, my favorite chapter in Northern is, is often the, the Council of Elrond, which is basically kind of like a, exactly the same thing, but a bit later. Exactly, yes. Because like, that, that was an early backstory. Now we're going to really, really get into it. I think it's fantastic. One of the things the movies do really well is they show just how interesting, exciting all of that content is if you put it in the right place within the narrative instead of just dumping it in. So. Uh, yeah, I, you've probably got to go some before you hit those kinds of extremes anyway. So, mm. <laughs> What about hard, then? Oh. Or oh, more challenging. <laughs> Any dialogue but in between, like, you know, on, like, you know, real people talking about emotions and feelings and so forth. Okay. Stuff that has to sit like that, like, you know, where you're trying to make characters feel alive and rounded and, like, you know, like normal people. And they're going, this is awkward. <laughs> I, I just try and watch normal people and then see how they talk to each other because they, they, I don't understand how any of that works. But see, no, normal people talk around these things. Like, no, no one ever, ever like you know, says really, or people rarely see what they're actually feeling. There's always like it's, it's always like done through like you know, you know like talking around the topic or like you know, get annoyed about this, some minor thing when they're actually feeling, you know, which is fine in like you know drama. But if you need to get like, you. Know, get this heartfelt emotional conversation over with in like five pages because you have this giant policy coming up for the next chapter. 
the other thing you become much more aware of, I think, once you start writing conversations is just how much you say, um, when you're talking to people normally, isn't it? Or yeah. that, just that moment of the, my brain has now switched off, I've just made a noise, but it's okay, because we'll both gloss over it and keep going. Again, kind of hard to get away with that one in text. Yeah, I probably do that too much of the characters who stammer, and I just like I, I, I write the dialogue, please just fix it so it's like your proper dialogue, and then put the stammers back in. I'm like I don't know what's <laughs> best to, to do here. I go back and delete ellipses from the meaningful pauses. This, uh, everyone ends up stand, sounding a little bit like William Shatner if I'm not careful. <laughs> Indeed, I found myself putting semicolons in dialogue at one point. I think that's probably wrong. <laughs> I put loads of semicolons in and then it goes to copy edit and then I find there are a lot of little red lines through them all. Those are... Okay. And then we've all gone quiet. Mm. Oh, questions are going, going. We yeah. probably wouldn't have found that one enough anyway, don't they? Yeah, we, we, we have a little bit of there. I've lost your video. Can you hear me? You've lost my video. I've still got you, so... Okay, we shall, we shall press on. Okay, let's maybe yes. the other format. Uh, do, do you both have a favorite fantasy game? Uh, your turn to go first. Um, You're not allowed to pick one you've written. Can I pick what I've written for? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, I'm fairly eclectic in my taste. Um, I, I have played many, many, many role playing games, and I would, would probably get in trouble for. Plugging, pl uh, <coughs> plugging them on an Orbit event. Um, I can plug the free um, gutter theme or gutter prayer themed ro one shot role game I wrote, which is available on, on my website. Um, link in the somewhere. Um, no, I don't, I play, I, I, I'm still playing Dungeons and Dragons and it's many, many variants and would recommend everyone else does too. Um, in terms of computer games, I have three kids. I have, computer games are a vague and distant memory. A large chunk of the gutter prayer is having played the first five minutes of Dishonored and never get a chance to finish it. And I want to see what happens to the rest of it. Yourself? Oh, I am absolutely in love with Dark Souls uh, and have been for years now. Uh, and I include Bloodborne in that. Not so much Demon Souls, found that a bit clunky. But the just the world building and the depth of detail that goes into those games is absolutely fantastic. It's um, it's really strange because it's not conventional narrative in there because, of course, all the background is hidden in item descriptions and implied through the level design, which is then complicated further by the fact that, like any computer game, it's radically overhauled in the six months before releases. They realize they can't do everything that they wanted to, or the creative director's changed his mind about what wants to go in there at all. So everyone's there piecing together these little bits of lore in background and this and the other. This is the true story. And then they find something in the old files which is shipped with the game, go, but this completely changes the sequence of everything. But it doesn't matter because the atmosphere behind them is just absolutely fantastic. I particularly like Bloodborne for its. Um, the way that it sort of starts in a sort of almost traditional gothic horror setting. So it's vampires and werewolves and, and all of that good stuff. And then as the game goes through and your understanding of the world is evolving, it then transfers much more cleanly into almost sort of Lovecraftian era uh, horror. And the sort of weird fiction aspect of it all starts to become a little bit different. And I'm not as much of a fan of uh, Lovecraftian horror as I am a sort of classic gothic horror stuff, but just how it does that, and it almost becomes this um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? It's almost this meta commentary on how the genre has evolved over the years. He just waved something brown and shiny at me. I'm oh. not sure I should be scared. Nah, ah, <laughs> gotcha. Oh. Or the, like, you know. I would never have guessed you liked Cthulhu, <laughs> having read Gutter Prayer. Um, but um, yeah, I I just love it. I I love the combat system. I love how everything unveils in it. I love that there's a load of freedom in there. Just wonderful games, and I think anyone who has a bit of a taste for fantasy worlds in general, they're absolutely worth checking out. Don't be put off by the uh, you died. It's really hard and get good reputation because actually. They're not 
they just play by different rules to modern games. They're much more like the kinds of things I grew up on back where you had eight colors and you had to wait 10 minutes for the thing to load to this machine. So, yes, absolutely check those out. The YouTube videos of them I've watched will be very interesting. That's about, as far as I've gotten. Right. Well, that's fascinating, too. Um, ba -ba -ba. What's, no way to... Um, are the titles your books uh, have now the titles you're using from the beginning? If not, what were the original titles of your books and how did you come up with the final title? Right, my turn again, isn't it? Damn it. Um, <laughs> I was actually really surprised because um, Legacy of Ash has always been Legacy of Ash when it when it became a book. The setting had been around for years. I've experimented with other stories within that setting. When I finally went, now I'm going to tell this story, it was Legacy of Ash. And actually, strangely, actually the second book in the series, which is out in November this year, Legacy of Steel, also always had that name. Although I'm slightly weird because I, I kind of wanted to change it, but the publisher wanted to keep it. So uh, that's a bit weird. That's the other way around how it normally happens as far as I understand. Uh, the jury's still out on the third one at the moment, which I can't name drop for at least that reason here, because as soon as I do, then no, 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 we're going to call it something else now, I'm sure. Um, well, is, is this going to be legacy of something? <laughs> it will definitely be, I say definitely, where's that piece of wood again? Um, it will probably be called legacy of something. Um, but uh, no, it, it was really strange because at every stage I was kind of expecting, ah, oh, but we do need to call it something else. We do the... Uh, because that's that's just something that I think received wisdom prepares you for a little bit. Um, and I was quite, I, I'm still slightly surprised it was that straightforward, to be honest. How about yourself? Um, the gutter prayer was the gutter prayer pretty much all the way through. Other than it, it, it initially started as NaNoWriMo 2014-1, <laughs> but uh, that apparently wasn't a marketable title. Um, the Shadow Saint started out as the Divine Machine and was the Divine Machine for a very long time. But it got changed um, because apparently Machine was a bit too steampunky and steampunky wasn't in. And I fought, fought against it for the length of one email and then went, yeah, sure, you guys know best. And lo, they did. Um, it's, it's a weird thing, isn't it? So steampunk has become this weird sort of... Um... It's like the blob, isn't it? It started eating things in adjacent to it. Um, and I was wondering steampunk as the, the punk suffix. Yes. I, I'm unsure if there's a single noun you can put, you can, you can like not put punk afterwards. Uh, I heard a game being called Witch Punk earlier. Um, a friend of mine is urging me to do something with diesel punk. I see diesel punk. I you see the steampunk and diesel punk thing. I kind of understand because it then ties into that sort of that motive force behind everything. Hydro. But punk. Th then they've picked other things up along the way, haven't they? So steampunk has got a, a, tends towards a very Victorian aesthetic, or rather, more accurately, before I embarrass myself in front of a whole bunch of people who clearly know more about this than I do. If you write a Victorian fantasy book, you've got to work really hard to not have it branded as steampunk, oh, yeah. regardless. Of steam or it's lack thereof. You, you get steam or gothic. I think there, there are two yeah. options there. <laughs> and romance, obviously, because romance yeah. traps has all boundaries. But, but... It's probably going to be gothic. Probably going to be gothic romance. <laughs> That's true. Probably with a nice ruined house on a cliffside somewhere. Mm -hmm. I do like nice ruined houses on cliffsides, though. So, <laughs> um, rush to do. That's our next highest rated thing. What's the favorite part of the writing process for each, for each of you? It's definitely your turn again. <laughs> um, the absolute favourite part are the very, very rare times when it just works. Like, only three or four times I had a situation where I've sat down and written something I really, really like that really surprised me. Um, like, there's an, there's an interlude in The Gutter Prayer, and it's like, Several people, it's a favorite part of the book. It's one of my favorite parts of the book as well. And I have no idea where it came from. I just sort of sat down and went, and it came out. And it was great. And it was really easy. No, I bet I know which bit you mean, but I will forbear from commenting for the, the no spoilers thing. It's, it's the internet, it's, it's, it's the middle bit. Yeah. Uh, 
But yeah, I mean, mo- mo- other days it is like you know, an absolute grind. You're just like, you know, you sit there for like four hours, you look up and, oh, I've got like, you know, 600 words done. Where the hell did that time go? And the answer is Twitter normally. <laughs> um, I also really like the bit where I have the shape of the book. I have the, the plot worked out and now I can go back and be clever. And like, you know, because like, oh, lots of like foreshadowing and character development happens once the book is done. And you're going, okay, I know, like, you know, Right, this character is going to like, it was die, die heroically at the end. I would uh, run back and like you know, add like, like you know, twenty percent more tragedy, ten percent more self sacrifice, a little bit of foreshadowing here. I, you know, I make them love him here. Now, we, now, we, now we can die properly. No, I think I I like the end of the process partly because I can go. Oh, thank goodness for that! It's done. Um, <laughs> but also because actually, when I, I go back and edit things. It is part of what you've just described. It's about just finding those things in the the manuscript where you go, this is really important. I know it's really important. I'm not sure the reader's going to know it's important. So let's just go back and and make that stand out a little bit more. Here's here's this character that I introduced whimsically. Uh, Let's just make sure their name shows up a little bit earlier on so it doesn't feel quite so jarring. Um, There's also that thing as well of this this is horrible. This is horribly egotistical, but it means that when I go back and I read it and go, actually, this isn't awful. That's fantastic. <laughs> all, all those things that I've struggled with that seem like really big deals while I was writing it, you go, oh, this is the chapter I tried to write three times and I still hate. Oh, no, actually, it's all right now. Um, and that's that's wonderful. And given the choice, that's the way around I want it. Oh, nice. It's like the doing a, a polished first draft thing. It's the all the pain at the front. And yeah. then you can go back, and when you're going back and you're rereading it for edits, or you get your copy edits through, or whatever, and you go, ah, oh, maybe I don't suck at this. That's nice. <laughs> Do you ever find yourself adding like random bits in in the early drafts, and they become important later on? And you're going, thanks, Blake, you thanks, my subconscious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I trust my subconscious to do all kinds of things at this point because. Mm-hmm it fixes most of my problems for me. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. What's the answer to this thing? Well, you know that, that thing you just put in as an aside 60 pages earlier? You'll be pleased to know it's actually now integral to the plot. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. The, the, the moment that Legacy of Ash really comes alive for me is about 100 pages into it, where I'd, I just hit this point, because you, know, you know that whole million words thing, I'd, I'd written a bunch of bits and pieces before, um and actually you, the more you write and you don't get the success with it the harder the next thing becomes not necessarily starting it because you write because you want to write but you get that as soon as you get into that point and you think you're a chunk of the way and you and particularly with legacy of astro i was looking and going so yeah there's there's a lot of words in this and there's going to be a lot more before i'm done how much how much of my life am I potentially putting in the shredder here? I mean, you start to get a little bit, oh, I hope I'm doing the right thing. I hope I'm doing the right thing. And then I just hit a point where we go, but there are these other characters you were thinking about using and they don't they don't fit the story as written at all yet. But you know what? Just put them in, them in there anyway because you'll at least enjoy yourself while you're doing it. And they actually lift so much of the narrative and build, pack the world out so much further. Because they just introduce a chunk more of the sort of the magical side of things, and it it's that weird thing. I think particularly with fantasy, you need to establish your tone very very early because it can it is this huge genre with so much going in in it, um, and you know ranging from sort of crazy fairy powered steampunk at one end, I guess, and then at the other you have the well, it may as well be Earth. Everything's got slightly different names in it, yeah, and you can any and all of those things, particularly if you're rattling around somewhere between those points, uh, like I certainly am, and I think Go to Prayer does as well, it's just getting that tone early on so your reader goes, right, now I know what to expect now. And it also yeah. helps you as a writer. As well as possible. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you can go, am I, still, am I still in the same tone over here, or has this suddenly become some strange farcical comedy that happens to have source? No, we're good. We can keep going. It's fine. Um, yeah. I... I, I one thing, actually, uh, this is just getting because we were talking about fantasy games earlier. Because, of course, mm-hmm. one thing I know, not from talking to you, but from reading some of the interviews, is that um, sort of the the Thief series of games was part of your inspiration, isn't it? 
And the fun thing is, is that it was for me as well. And we both run with it in completely different directions. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. It's just the power of a really well-built world can be because yeah. we've each got our own little thing that we love from that. And that's become a, a linchpin, hasn't it? It's great. Well, the thing that you know from the themes, the robots, are, the crackons are... No, they're, they're not from there at all. The thing that comes from from Thief more than anything else is sort of from the pagan aspect of it, of which, right. to be honest, we see very little of in Legacy of Ash. Uh, but just the idea of what it did for me at the time, because I, I go back all the way back to the very first one. Um, what it did for me is it was the first time I'd really seen sort of magic and technology coexisting in a fantasy setting. And just that idea of it, it was just very, very different. And I loved, sort of loved a lot of the visuals to it. Because, of course, you go back and you look at it now. I tried, I tried playing it about three years ago, and it's it's not a game you can go back to really at all. Um, but things like the cutscenes with the style of animation and just how some of the characters talk. Uh, what's his name? Is it Stephen Russell? Is it is the voice of Garrett? And it's fantastic. Nobody. Um, very, very dry delivery, and it's just he's he's a great example of a protagonist that you do like because he's quirky, and it's it's absolutely wonderful. Um, there, I've run out of steam on that one now. <laughs> of course. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. From Twitter, we are asked, "Who is your favorite character in your book to write? Is a hero or a villain?" Your turn to go first. But I think. Um, I really like Anastasia, uh, which probably is no surprise to anyone who's read her, uh, because she gets to say the things that we're all thinking. <laughs> and that's always wonderful. Um, it's a, you know, all, all my characters have a, have a substantial part of my personality hiding behind them. Um, so I, I have the capacity to be incredibly boring, as some people have now discovered, and incredibly malicious. I, at least I hope I keep that largely under control. Uh, but saying things that maybe I shouldn't just because they're true, yeah, that's one of mine. So Anastasia gets to do that for me. It's fantastic. Yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to think who my favourite one to write is. Again, again we're really looping back to the whole, like, you know, Writing supporting characters is often more fun than protagonists because, like, you know, um, Alina, who was basically like, you know, fantasy hero dropped into a not especially heroic story, was great fun to write because, again, she was able to be super direct and, but like, you know, had been around the block and seen all this before. So, whatever else was going, oh my God, it's in the world, she was able to go, yeah, it's, it's Tuesday for me. Um, I, I, I like just taking characters who can, like, you know, talk at length, which again is me. Just to do the whole, like, you know. Now we'll all, all stand here for half an hour while I just while I discuss history at you. Um, in terms of like you know, not dog action, Forte, I, I really enjoy writing Carrie because her reaction to everything is basically either run away or stab it. So it's like trying to <laughs> you know, build scenes in the same way once sort of, like you catch an alley cat or something. So put a, put a rock, box around her. She bounced around it for a while. Um, so we just went there how sweary Alina was. No joking, I was watching um, The Thick of It one night. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly this character, because she, she, she wasn't in the original plan for the novel at all. I just had, had like, you know, one rat to make, you know, bounce off so what, uh, a quick, a quick, quick, um, he needed to, to say something in the script for some reason long ago and i was going okay she he meets someone it's like some old woman visiting her like husband's grave or something and there's watching malcolm tucker and suddenly it's going like you know, <laughs> can, we, can we swear on, on orbit official chats i don't i don't know i mean beep beep you beeping beeping you beep, beep you're beeping deep yeah I, it's pro there's probably a whole subgenre of Fantasy books Armando Iannucci has inadvertently inspired. Have you uh, seen Death of Stalin? Yes, <laughs> I definitely have, and I can say no more at that point. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are meandering. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. What other contemporary fantasy authors do you recommend to people? This, this is the kind of question that 
does me no favors whatsoever because it's where I have to say, I don't really read books anymore. <laughs> I never find the time for it. It's that I don't even have children as excuse. I have very demanding cats, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, <laughs> and so I tend to find that what I take in tends to come in through a screen these days. Uh, I, so I, I, I play a lot of video games. I I watch films. I watch. I try and find TV series. Sometimes quite old ones that I haven't been able to watch. So it's an awful question for to ask me because I never have a good answer. It just makes me seem incredibly ignorant and disconnected. But uh, <laughs> Gareth's now going to make up for it because he's going to wax rhapsodic on the topic. Yes, because thank you. With thank you, three kids have so much time to read. And <laughs> but the other sec, semi embarrassing thing is once you become a published author by a big company, they send you lots of books. And like, if it was to like, you know, list the fantasy authors I've read recently, it would be strangely similar to the Orban Pack catalogue of the last couple of years. <laughs> or J. Barker, Tash Suri, um, Joshua, Fuchs of Babel, person who's lovely. And I can't remember his second name all of a sudden. Fuchs of Babel guy, he's fantastic. Um, to move briefly outside orbit, um, Bancroft, thank you, or thank you, orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going, Joshua Alsop? Josiah Bancroft. Who the hell is Josiah Alsop that I just conjured out of nowhere? Um, who else? Um, what well, character do you need to know um, next time? Max Gladstone are absolutely fantastic. Jeff Vandermeer, um, if you like mushrooms, he is the like most mushroom centric fantasy author you were like to encounter. Is that as in sort of sentient mushrooms or illicit substances? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he, he, the, man, the man is big into his fungi. Um, who else? Contemporary, like, you know, that's like you know, this century, right? <laughs> <laughs> this Tolkien guy, he's a real up and comer. <laughs> It's not been a hundred years, it counts, it's fine. Exactly, down in the 70s, I mean, practically modern. Yes. Um, that covers that. Any science fiction people? Or are we, are we, are we? Nah, it's fantasy. Screw them, they're spaceships. Uh, what? Science fiction is just fantasy in space, it's fine. It's there we are, that'll, that'll get people angry. It will. <laughs> What's your daily writing schedule like? Um, it's really, really boring is that I get up, I start writing and then I stop when I feel like I can face myself having done it. Um, normally that means I try to get a chapter done, but because my chapters can run from anything from about 1500 words to 5000s pre to me attacking it with a knife, as I can see the word count going up and the amount of story not necessarily. <laughs> improving. Um, it means days can run quite long. I mean, this, today, for example, I started around half eight. I was still writing before I came away to come and do this. And I know it's not done. Uh, so that's going to be tomorrow morning's job now because I can't leave that till next week because otherwise I will sit down on Monday and I will be left with these 250 words-ish, I hope I've got, which means I've got about 500 or 750. And I'll go, hey, I've done that. It's the end of a chapter. And there's a little switch in my brain that goes, you finished the chapter, congratulations. You've done your work for today. And then I've lost most of the day as a result. It's, it's awful. Uh, <laughs> what about yourself? I mean, are we, are we, are we talking pre or post pandemic? <laughs> so like, you know, my writing schedule was very, very different before, like you know, the world ended, and like you know, schools stopped, and they, like you know, we all became locked in our houses. Um, normally, it's like get up um, once kids are up to school, then write till lunchtime, stop, eat lunch, <laughs> write again for a while. That said, I have like, I, I long ago learned the trick of writing anywhere, any when. Um, I can remember like you know, writing, like, I've written like books on buses and in, I wrote one fantasy source book on the deck of a, of a ship, which is on the Great Barrier Reef, which was like, you know, honestly a really stupid thing to do because I should have just gone like, look. <laughs> There's a wonder of nature that is rapidly vanishing. I should look at that as opposed to writing a Hawkmoon adventure. 
See, I, I used to be able to, I, I can remember sort of sitting down and writing in bursts when I had the opportunity around other things. And I just find I can't do it anymore. I've been a prop, I've become a proper grumpy Edred and I'll write it now, except without the, uh, yeah, without some of the, the other terrible things that go with it. And I just, I just need to sit down. I need to be in my space. I need to have some headphones to block everything out. And the, the to do want it to around something else. <sighs> If you want to recapture that talent, I can send you some kids over, and they will instruct you. Quite completely. bad enough, actually. <laughs> um, it's the the door is shut at the moment, which we've uh, we've not been disturbed. But it'll be the one where you suddenly go, why why do why is my back hurt? It's because a cat has launched itself at me because I'm not paying attention, <laughs> or there's one on my shoulder like this, but doesn't want to climb all the way up, so it just scrabbles at me until I put a hand under it. At which point, typing with one, not so easy. I think we're quick fire around here. What's the hardest thing we're in the second book in a series? Um, are you doing a trilogy or do you know how many books you're doing? Me? Uh, they've started calling it the Legacy Trilogy, so I, I do hope that it's three. Uh, <laughs> I'm currently writing the third one at the moment. Um, weirdly, the second one started very straightforwardly. Um, and I'm not sure why that was. I, I kind of knew where I wanted to come into it long before I sat down. Um, and it kind of flowed from there. The The biggest issue with that was the, is this as good as the one that came before? Does this feel like the same kind of thing? And that, I think, stayed with me all the way through and now into the third book and will be with me forever. Uh, I don't think that's something you ever outrun. The third one, comparatively, that, that was really hard just knowing where to start that one because there were two really obvious jumping on points and one allowed me loads of character development and all the rest of it and the other one is the big action thing that you can probably infill everything that comes before it through exposition and i went backwards and forwards on that so much and i changed out a load of the characters in the scene i was writing i just that probably much more what my second book should have felt like just rampant indecision and uh seeing the time tick 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 away for me the hardest thing was um there were loads of bits in the like not such like unfinished bits in the first book but like you know minor dangling plot threads which had no bearing at all on the plot of the second book but i wanted to, I wanted to go back and address them like no one in world, not like barely even me in some certain moods, cares about like you know, who is now in charge of the city watch having killed the guy who was in charge in the first book, or like you know, these like obscure bits of political intrigue. I still want to go, I want to go back and address that. I'm going to drag the character over there so they can watch someone address it. So a lot of that got cut out of me just basically sweeping up after the first book. <laughs> And if the series keeps going on and on and on, there'll be an awful sweep to fix. It's just um, a way of making sure they say in print. They say, no, no, there are vital questions that need answering. No one does appendices anymore. I went to appendices again. <laughs> <laughs> that's where Talcy, that's where that's Talcy's genius. Like you stick all the stuff you want you actually want to write about. <laughs> oh, that's a slightly different thing. That's when you want to reprint it, but have enough material to make it count as a separate work for copyright purposes. Ah. Um, do you both have a favourite fantasy book and or writer? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to... Let, let, let's say not Tolkien. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cheating. I don't that's... have read any of the fantasy books. No, um, there are other ones out there. <laughs> there are. I, I, I think I've had some on my shelves at various points as well, but you see, that's just thoroughly derailed me. Um, one of one of the series that I actually love, even though I haven't read any of the new books in it for probably twenty years at this point, uh, is Terry Brooks's Shannara. Um I love the generation. Pardon? That's basically dog. No, 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 no. The first one is the 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 very first one is. But what I really enjoy about it is particularly by the time you get into the the cycle that comes after the one that I'm going to completely mis misname because I was going to call it the Science of Shinara and I'm fairly sure that's actually the first book so clearly I love it as I've forgotten everything important about them <laughs> um, 
But what I really like about it is by the time you get to that point is you start to get this arc of generational storytelling. The thing that Tolkien actually does in Shadow of the Past and Council of Elrond is actually then played out within the narrative. Right. The Shire, because it calls back to the earlier books. And by the time you come back around to First King of Shannara, which is, what, the eighth book that was written, but is actually, at the time, was then the first one in the sequence, if you don't count Running with the Demon and all the other things that are set in the contemporary world, which are also part of the set. But that then really leaned into that, so you then started to see where some of the other bloodlines came in, and it actually did what any great prequel written after the event should do, which feels like it was always there. And for all I know, it was always in his head when he was writing it. But I, I just remember really, really enjoying that. And just some of those ideas that actually history becomes very cyclical. And once you're touched by destiny, that's it. Sorry, you, that's, that's your whole family screwed now because they're all part of it. I kind of like that as a concept. There we are. I did have something fantastic. <laughs> um, my sort of default answer here is normally Robert Holstock's uh, Lavandus, which is the second book in his um, Mythical Wood series. And the first book is great. It's basically this um, weird forest in England, and like you know, time is distorted in there. And like stories come to life from there. And the first book is this fairly sort of conventional two guys go off and explore the wood, strange things happen to them. And the second book is this wonderfully surreal, dreamlike one where the main character is she starts off as a child and sort of grows up on her journey through the forest. And it just gets very sort of like you know, it's Jay towards the end where she like you know dies and turns into a tree and is reborn. And it's all very, very strange. That's one of the it's one of these books and one of these like you know chose text where i don't know how he did it like there's there some writers i can sort of sit down and go i can see how you would do this like you know i i might not be able to repeat things exactly but i can sort of see the thought process that, that go in like one of my absolute favorite bits of text now medium is this intro this first page of an M. John Harrison short story um, called, oh, what's it called? Like, the title of something like, you know, of the Horse of Iron and how he can know it and be changed by it forever. But the first scene is basically a description of, of the narrator, like the, 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 watching TV and seeing this documentary about, um, about, be, about metalworking and forging and him going, that's not strange enough, and writing the story. I could, I would never be brave enough or just to have the idea of starting the story that way. So I, I'm always drawn to things I can't do. Um, so yeah, and that's an uh, absolute not answer. But uh, yeah, um, do you spend most of your time work in drafting or in revision? Uh, drafting for me definitely. Um, I normally have the book like took me for the shadow saint or for the third one actually i started that in like september i think or august september and had a like submissible draft um at the start of last month and i had the book finished by february so like september to february was like writing and then basically about a month to revise what about you for yeah, I mean, we've we've kind of talked about this a little bit anyway. Um, and yes, it's it's the drafting time. Um, editing is fun because it's actually a lot quicker because I already have the pieces. I, I just know what I, I need to fix. So I'll normally assume that the longest point is sitting there with the Kindle going through highlighting things line by line and then getting through that quickly enough so that by the time I sit down in front of the PC, I haven't forgotten why I've highlighted anything in the bug, which normally works. Uh, <laughs> do, do you know what I've done? I've found a service which will print out and bind your books. <laughs> so I spend like you know, 40 quid, send them or like you know, a 500 page Word doc. And they post it. Like, ways to avoid throwing paper away though. So it's, uh, it's so handy to be able to like, step away from the computer and like write notes on it. 
<laughs> I, I have never, I have never been able to do that. It, it feels like work, but then my handwriting is atrocious, so well, that doesn't. I'm help. too, but I can, I can do squiggles and interpret them. <laughs> it's like the bit in Dirk Gently, where like you, know, <laughs> I have translated this intractable problem, this like intractable logic problem, into a simple linguistic puzzle. Or it was working on what language I've written this in. <laughs> um, oh, oh. A cabbage asks, uh, very, very quickly, when you're juggling multiple character point of views for single conflict, how do you decide what perspective to go for? Um, that's really straightforward. And it's, it's a horrible cheats answer, but it's whichever one obscures just the right amount of information <laughs> from the reader. <laughs> Um, because yeah, some, sometimes if if the danger with picking the wrong perspective is you end up with a character whose thought process is, 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 should all be about the thing that you don't want the reader to know at that given point, and that's where the wheels can come off really, really quickly. I think I've only had to go back and change it once uh, so far, but I've not done it writing this third one i'm a long way off from editing it so it could all change very quickly after that but yeah it's it's all about picking what you want the the reader to see which sometimes means what you don't want them to see yeah i, I suspect i sort of draw on my like role-playing background to do it because like, you know, often if you have like you know, three or four player characters in the same situation you want on different sides and you don't want them to kill each other. You sort of separate them very slightly physically, so they can't like run. <laughs> so I often like you basically just drop walls in the way, or like you have them. Just like you, you, there's a there's a bit in the shadow set actually where all three I think yeah, all three characters meet up in the same place, almost. <laughs> in that one guy is locked in a church, um, down the road. The other two characters are in this house that's being attacked, and then they get separated fairly quickly. So the same thing, like all three characters seeing the same set of events, but from very different perspectives, and they're just separated enough so their perspectives aren't are, are should they different. Are they, they're di their perspectives are different perspectives on the same thing? There is a genius sentence here, right there. <laughs> it's all right. We're off the clock now. We don't have to do words. It's good. It's true. Uh, <laughs> No, it's, it's 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 fun stuff. Um, we are running out of time. I suppose yeah. we should probably just answer very quickly the one about the Mayday Com. Yeah, we 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 have a question for, or a plug phrase as a question. Yes. <laughs> Will you be streaming Mayday Con on May sixteen? And the answer is yes. We are, but we are both trapped in a virtual box again. I think and aren't we? Are, we 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 were joined by wonderful people, um, who, who I should know of hand. RJ Barker. That sounds vaguely wonderful. Yeah, I may just be repeating names I've seen written down recently, though, so that's a bit of a challenge. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll open, open Twitter and check. But but we'll both be there, and that's why you'll be coming, obviously, because you can't get enough waffle offers. Exactly, and we, we'll be waffling with other people. Where are we? Where's the schedule? Do that. I may reset my stay, video stay. camera, so I'm looking at it. <laughs> ah, here we are. Oh no! Uh, to do yes, um, Angus Watson and David Rag should be joined. Two of us and RJ Barker um, are on the topic. Are magic systems important to make great fantasy? And it says it's at seven a.m. on the sixteenth, but that is seven a.m. American time, so it's the same time for normal people. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we uh, we, we will not distribute because that's a technical thing, but. It will be streamed. Streaming will happen to it. Presumably. <laughs> Pretty sure. Gareth has promised it will now happen. It's fine. Yeah, well, we, we have staff for that. <laughs> what a fantastic lie. Uh, <laughs> right. right. Um, yes, oh, and yes, or, or, Orbit is, is reminding us to shut to up. Think, that green button which you can't see to buy books and if you're watching the recording of this then you can not click on that button but you can still buy the books in at some point when bookstores open again <laughs> or online do you remember bookstores do you remember outside <laughs> it'll all be fine sooner or later but uh, yes thank you everyone for coming hopefully we we got around your questions and we got around them 
in a way that was vaguely informative or at least entertaining. Yep. Uh, and I'm sure we will do it again sometime. Yep. yep. On Twitter, I'm at Mythilder, and you're at Tower of Stars, isn't it? I'm Tower? At the Tower of Stars. I'm the Tower of Stars pretty much everywhere. So if you want to find me on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, that's where you find me. How old, how old is that username? Because Mythilder was like your know, back in college days. I've had it since like you know, 1999. Oh, you see, now you've asked. So the, here by hangs back when I started working on this stuff years and years ago. I mean, 20, uh, years ago, I had the Tower of Stars as an email address, which I then let lapse and vanished. <laughs> but now it's all come back again. So everything old is new again. It's it's wonderful. As opposed to the Tower of, the Tower of Stars 2. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a bit weird. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you all. Um, at some point, Orbit will click. Oh, 